Let us hear the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, our help is in you, the maker of heaven and earth. And so I pray that you would come now and concentrate our minds, bend our wills to your will, and stir our affections for you, the living God. And we ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever praised. Amen. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, the opening words of this famous chapter in Isaiah strike an ominous tone. King Uzziah had reigned for 52 years over Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. If I may be a, a wee bit British for a moment, uh, he was like Her Majesty the Queen of the United Kingdom, the longest serving monarch of the British Empire. Well, Uzziah was one of the longest serving reigning monarchs in the Davidic dynasty, over half a century. Second Chronicles 26 verse 4 tells us that he was a godly man and did, quote, what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord blessed him. He had victories in battles over the Philistines and other nations. He strengthened the defense of Jerusalem with tars and reinforced the city walls. He expanded Judah's agricultural productivity. He restored Judah's military power close to what it was in David's day. Here was a great king. Here was a beloved king. But his life did not end well. Uzziah became proud and presumptuous. On one occasion, he entered the temple to offer incense, something only the priests were allowed to do. When the priests confronted him, he began screaming at them in a rage, only to find leprosy breaking out on his scalp. 
As a result, for the last 10 years of his life, he lived in a separate house as a leper until his death in 740 BC. And in that moment of his death, in that moment of national mourning, the prophet Isaiah went to the temple, presumably looking for some consolation because he had known King Uzziah personally. Isaiah was not like other prophets who were generally from working class backgrounds like Amos the shepherd. Isaiah was a man of nobility, a prophet in the king's courts. He was like the queen's chaplain, the president's chaplain. He'd been at the king's dinner table for banquets. He'd been in the king's courtroom for the political discussions. He had walked the corridors of the king's palace and heard the royal rumors. He was a man in the know, a man of personal acquaintance with this great king come tragic leper. And now Isaiah's world was falling apart because his king was dead. The great Uzziah, the beloved Uzziah, was now the dead Uzziah. The nation and the people had entered into a time of great uncertainty, of instability. Assyria was growing in power and invading other lands. And now there was this crisis in sovereignty. The king is dead. It is not dissimilar to when a nation finds itself in a leadership transition like this nation has just found itself. One president has left office not so quietly. Another president has come into office, not so quietly. It's been a volatile few weeks, hasn't it? It's always a time of uncertainty, of instability, when there's a change or a crisis in sovereignty. And then add to that the pandemic or the panicdemic, whatever way you want to read 2020. It's been a time of uncertainty and instability across the world at a national level. But we also experience times of uncertainty, instability, changes and crises of sovereignty at a personal level. Every week we experience things that bring uncertainty and instability into our lives. Whoever we are, whatever age and stage of life we're at, life can throw things at us that unsettle us, destabilize us, the tragic news about one of our children, the shocking diagnosis of cancer. Whatever it is, it can unsettle us. And if some of those things are completely out of our control, then we are quickly reminded that we are not the kings and queens of our own lives. The king is dead because we're not the king or queen of our own lives. We're not in control. There's a crisis of sovereignty. And that's exactly what Isaiah experienced at a national and a personal level in the year that King Uzziah died. He realized that he and his king were no longer in control. And through that experience, Isaiah learned five things that he needed to know for his own life. There are five things that we need to know for our lives especially at this moment in history as we seek to be faithful in our service in God's kingdom. Here's the first thing we need in moments of uncertainty and instability in times of change and crises of sovereignty. We need to see the Lord on His throne. Verse 1, we need to see the Lord on His throne. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now, those opening words are quite surprising if you think about it. Not because Uzziah had died suddenly. As I mentioned earlier, he was unwell for the last 10 years of his life, so his death was not that surprising. The surprise is who Isaiah mentions after the death of Uzziah. We'd expect him to say, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Jotham. Uzziah's son sitting on the throne. In other words, the king is dead. Long live 
the king. So what happens in the transition in monarchies, in countries that have monarchies? In 1952, the newspaper headlines in Great Britain when King George VI died were, the king is dead, long live the queen. And one day in our time, we'll hear the words, the queen is dead, long live the king. It's a saying that is meant to stop uncertainty, to stave instability, to solve the crisis of sovereignty. The king is dead, yes, but long live the king. And that's exactly what Isaiah sees, only it's not Jotham sitting on a throne. It's Jehovah sitting on a throne. The king is dead, yes, and long live the king. This is what Isaiah needed to see in the midst of uncertainty and instability and the crisis of sovereignty. He needed to see not Jotham sitting on the throne, but Jehovah sitting on the throne. He needed to see the Lord on his throne. It's what we need to see at any point in a nation's history, at any point in our personal lives, at any point in a world crisis, we need to see the Lord sitting on His throne. And when I say sitting, I don't mean He's sitting on the edge of His throne, getting a wee bit anxious about what's going to happen next. He is seated on His throne. When our world is in crisis, God is not in crisis. He is seated on His throne. When the world is battling a coronavirus, God is not panicking. He is seated on His throne. This is the first thing we need to see when our world falls apart internationally, nationally, personally. We need to see the Lord seated on His throne. Second, we need to see the Lord in His holiness. We need to see the Lord in His holiness, verses 1 to 3. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, He covered His face. With two, He covered His feet. And with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Notice what Isaiah sees. The Lord seated on a throne. He's reigning. The Lord high and lifted up. He's exalted. The train of his robe filling his temple. He's immense. He's majestic. There's a sense in which Isaiah is saying that he saw the Lord seated on his throne, but he was so highly exalted, so spectacularly immense, that he could only describe the fringe of what he was wearing. The train of his robe filled the temple. That's why he couldn't get any closer. This is, of course, a revelation of God condescended to Isaiah's mind because no one can see God in His bare essence and live. So what Isaiah sees here is a condescended vision of God on a throne. And yet, even in this accommodated revelation, Isaiah cannot get close to God. The train of His robe filled the temple. When Elizabeth II was coronated as queen in 1952, she walked into Westminster Abbey in London and sat down on her throne. She wore a beautiful white royal dress with a long train. But her beauty and her presence and her dress were not so immense that people couldn't get close to her. There were officials standing right beside her who came and coronated her. Her train was big, it was long, it was magnificent, but it didn't fill Westminster Abbey. Not so with God in His temple. In the inner sanctum of God's temple, there is no room for a person to get close. He is so highly exalted, so spectacularly immense, 
that you can only begin to describe the edge of his majesty, the tip of his robe. This is made clear by how the creatures in his presence conduct themselves, the seraphim. Verse 2, seraphim are fiery creatures, probably angels. Perhaps they get their fiery appearance because they glimmer in the light of God who himself is light. In any case, notice how these fiery heavenly creatures, they're all wings and all voice, six wings which convey service. They are at God's beck and call. They hover over him, waiting for his command. They use two wings to fly, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet. The covering of their faces show that God is too awesome to behold. No one can see God and live, not even the seraphim of heaven. The covering of their feet shows that God is too awesome to approach. They are there in the inner sanctum of God's presence, but they can't look. They are present in the very presence of God, but they can't approach. And that's surprising because these are unfallen seraphim. They're perfect. And even in their perfection, they cannot approach God. Their conduct underscores their creatureliness. However, there is one thing they can do. They can sing like angels. And what they sing is a kind of antiphonal song that highlights the Lord's uniqueness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, in English, as you know, many of you students here at Logos or homeschooled or at NSA, uh, you know that in English, to emphasize something, we put it in italics. We make it bold. We underline it. We put it in caps. Not so in Hebrew. The writers didn't have such things. Instead, they would repeat them. Repetition was one of the main ways to emphasize something. Twice if it was important. Thrice if it was super important. God the Lord is holy, holy, holy. This is actually a unique way of speaking about God in the Bible. Uh, never do we hear of God being love, love, love. Never do we hear of God being just, just, just. It only ever says in the Bible, He is holy, holy, holy. But what does that mean exactly? Well, holy comes from the verb to set apart. And so some think it means God is set apart, which is true. But in the Old Testament, a bronze basin could be set apart. It could be holy. So I don't think the angels are just singing set apart, set apart, set apart is the Lord of hosts. You theoretically could sing that to a bronze basin. I think what the seraphim mean here is the otherness of God, the distinctness of God. What makes God God? Hosea 11 verse 9 captures a sense of it. I am God, not man, the Holy One in your midst. I am God, not man, the Holy One in your midst. In other words, I am other than you are. When the seraphim sing, holy, 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 they are saying, God is other than we are. He is distinct from who we are in his godness. Martin Luther said it well, let God be God. And that's what I think Isaiah hears from the seraphim here. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. The seraphim sing about the glory of his essence, the glory of God in himself. The holiness of God involves the godness of God in his otherness. And that otherness, that Godness is something that God is entirely devoted to for His own glory. And so the seraphim sing to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. 
And it's all the seraphim sing over and over and over, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be. We mustn't think that Arch, uh, Archangel Gabriel sort of whistled to the angels five minutes before Isaiah went to the temple and said, guys, Isaiah's on his way to the temple. Quick, get the choir together. These angels, seraphim, have been singing this since their creation, and they will be singing it for all eternity. All that Isaiah saw that day was a peak into what was going in heaven, going on in heaven all along. And that's all they say, holy, 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 to describe what they're singing because there's a sense in which there are no other words to describe what they're singing, what they're seeing, sorry. It's a bit like Reaper Cheap in C.S. Lewis's Voyage of the Dawn Treader who sails to the end of the world. The seraphim reach the world's end in the ocean of language, if you like. It's like when Isaiah sees the fringe of his robe, the tip of his majesty. Now, Isaiah sees God's otherness, God's godness here in two ways. In verse 1 and 2, he sees God's majestic holiness. The Lord is on his throne, high and lifted up, and on his throne he is unbeholdable. He is unapproachable. In other words, what, God, what sets God apart as totally distinct, utterly unique, wholly other, is His awesome majesty. It's why Isaiah can't, it's why God can't be seen. It's why God can't be approached. He's transcendent above all things, distinct from all things. That's the first way Isaiah sees God's otherness, His majestic holiness. But there's also His moral holiness, His moral purity. If you glance down to verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. In God's presence, Isaiah feels sinful, which means God is the opposite of that. God is pure. He is righteous in all things and therefore distinct from all people. So there are two ways in which Isaiah sees the Lord's holiness. He sees His majesty and he sees his purity. He sees his transcendence, and he sees his righteousness. And the seraphim make clear that God's majestic moral holiness is not restricted just to this temple, verse 3. The whole earth is full of his glory. In other words, the Lord is no domestic deity. He's no regional regis. He's no local lord. He's no state-restricted sovereign. No, this king, this lord of holiness is lord over the whole world, and his glory fills that world. God is great. I love the story of King Louis XIV of France called himself the Sun King. He was a complete and utter narcissist. And even in his death, he wanted people to be focused on him. So that day in Notre Dame Cathedral at his funeral, there was a single light in the cathedral, a, a candle burning at the front of his coffin. Even in his death, he wanted everyone to be focused on him as the great Sun King. That day at the funeral, Massillon, the court preacher rose to give the funeral oration, and as he walked forward, he leant over and <laughs> blew out the candle. And in the darkness, the people heard these opening words, only God is great. Only God is great. And that's what Isaiah sees when the great Uzziah is dead. Only God is great. And it's what we need to see when the king is dead, when one president leaves and another one enters, when a nation enters a time of uncertainty and instability, when there's a change or a crisis in sovereignty, 
we need to see the Lord seated on His throne, and we need to see that only He is great. We need to hear the angels singing. Can you hear them? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But there's something else we need to see. Having seen the Lord on His throne, having seen the Lord in His holiness, third, we need to see ourselves in our sinfulness. We need to see ourselves in our sinfulness. Verses 4 and 5. When you are confronted with God Himself, you never come away unchanged or unmoved. You can't. Not even the temple does, verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called. Even the bricks were shaking at the song of the seraphim. And to the sight and the sound is added the smell of the smoke of incense coming from the altar of incense. The smoke was meant to convey that the naked human eye cannot look upon God. Though the eye of sinful man your glory may not see. Again, we're back to the earlier point. Isaiah sees the Lord, and yet he only can describe the fringe of his robe. Isaiah sees the Lord, and yet the smoke is rising and blinding him. And what becomes blindingly obvious to Isaiah now is that he cannot approach. The foundations of the doorways are shaking, so there's no way for him to get in. He can't even sing either, verse 5. He is a man of unclean lips. The seraphim can't look, the seraphim can't approach, but they can sing, but not Isaiah. He can't look, he can't approach, and he can't sing. He's drawn to the sight of God seated on his throne. He's drawn to the singing of the seraphim, and now he is repelled by it all. Woe is me, for I am lost. Woe. Whoever says woe anymore? Well, someone who's been in the presence of a thrice holy God. The word is tied to the curses of the Old Testament. It's the opposite of blessed. Isaiah realizes he's cursed. He's doomed. He's lost. But only after he's first experienced the wow. The woe only comes after the wow of what he sees. The word lost here comes from the word to be silenced, which means he can't sing along with the seraphim. But it's more than just being lost for words. Lips reveal hearts, as Jesus taught us. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. James says the tongue corrupts the whole person. The lostness that Isaiah sees here and feels here does not relate to a compartment of his life, just to his lips. No, the lostness is the whole of his life. What's exposed here is not so much Isaiah's lips, but his heart. He feels lost at the core of his being. He comes apart at the seams, what modern psychologists would call disintegration. He disintegrates in the presence of this God. Here is a man who had it all together, a prophet in the royal courts of the great king of Uzziah. And now here he is in pieces. Boys and girls, he was like Humpty Dumpty. You know that rhyme? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a big fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Why? Because he's in pieces. And that is how Isaiah felt like Humpty Dumpty in pieces in the presence of God. He lost all of his integrity. Here was the prophet who had earlier rebuked the nation for their sinfulness in chapters 1 to 5, and now he's got to deal with his own sinfulness in chapter 6, because he's just like them. Woe is me, for I am undone. But notice why Isaiah is undone. Notice why he's fallen to pieces, verse 5. For For my eyes have seen the king. Do you see it? No pun intended. For my eyes have seen the king. Wasn't because he saw his sin that he felt undone, though he does see his sin. No, he felt undone because he'd seen God. 
There are a lot of people in life who see their own sin and feel a wee bit guilty for it, but they never change. Why? Because they have never seen their sin in the light of the king. And the point is that Isaiah did not just intellectually see as a sinner. He experientially crumbled as a sinner. There was a godly sorrow to his repentance. And that's what we need in moments of uncertainty and instability and changes and crises of sovereignty, national or personal. We need to see the Lord on His throne. We need to see the Lord in His holiness. And having seen the Lord on His throne, having seen Him in His holiness, then we need to see ourselves in our sinfulness. But the good news is God doesn't leave us broken in pieces like Humpty Dumpty on the ground. Which brings us to our fourth point. We need to see the Lord's, we, sorry, we need to experience the Lord's restoration, verses 6 to 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Notice how passive Isaiah is in these verses. He doesn't ask for help. He's lost for words. God sees that he needs help, and he sends a seraphim. Now, God actually isn't mentioned in these verses, but seraphim don't act on their own accord. Remember, they have wings hovering above God, waiting for his beckoning call, waiting to serve. So when a seraphim flies to the altar, we may presume he has been sent there by God. And here he is sent to restore Isaiah. The angel flies to the altar, takes a coal from it. This may have been the, the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard or the altar of incense in the holy place. Uh, doesn't really matter because both were used to make atonement. Isaiah is in need of atonement. But notice the fiery angel can't personally handle the coal. It's too white hot. It's too holy. He needs a pair of tongs. Angels can't handle atonement things. They can only apply from a distance. They can only peer in above with interest. And the angel applies the atoning work to the very place where Isaiah felt his sin most, his lips. It's the most sensitive part of the body. If you've ever bit your lip, you know how sensitive it is. Imagine taking a coal from your barbecue and sticking it on your lip. It hurts, but it was necessary. In Isaiah's case, it must cover his sin. It must take away his guilt before he himself can be a spokesperson for God. And the order is important. Notice, sin must be covered. Guilt must be taken away before there can be a reintegration of the person in the service of God. In Isaiah's case, it's his lips. He was a prophet, God's mouthpiece, and if he was ever going to serve in God's kingdom, then he needed God's cleansing at the very place of service, his mouth, his lips. Isaiah might have felt like Humpty Dumpty, but God put him back together again. Do you know how it goes, boys and girls? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but who could? The king. The king. And that's what God the king does for Isaiah. And when he did, when God put him back together again, when God gave him his voice again, then Isaiah was ready for service in his kingdom. But notice how it comes about. It comes about by a king on a throne who is high and lifted up, providing atonement from an altar of sacrifice. Later in Isaiah, we read of Judah's king, the servant, the suffering servant being high and lifted up, Isaiah 52, providing atonement for the sin of his people, Isaiah 53. So, think about it. In Isaiah 6, we have a king in heaven who is high and lifted up, providing atonement from an altar of sacrifice. And in Isaiah 52 and 53, we have a king on earth, who is high and lifted up, providing atonement 
by the sacrifice of Himself. And in Jesus Christ, we find the fulfillment of both. He is the Lord of heaven, high and lifted up, who leaves His throne to provide an atonement on an altar of sacrifice, the cross. And He is the suffering servant who on the cross is high and lifted up and through the sacrifice of His death provides atonement for sins. This is why John tells us in his gospel that Isaiah saw God's glory in Isaiah 6 and spoke of Him, of Jesus. Isaiah saw a form of the pre-incarnate Son of God sitting on His throne. Jesus fulfills Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53, and in so doing, He reveals God's holiness to us, a holiness which exposes our sin. But notice also what that holiness does. It then atones for our sin. It's both. We often think God's holiness only exposes our sin. But no, God's holiness also atones for our sin. At the cross, God punishes sin. He is holy, righteous, holy, just. But at the cross, He also forgives our sin. He is holy love, holy gracious, holy merciful. The cross is the altar of sacrifice from which we receive God's forgiving touch on our lives just at the very place that we need it. And in receiving that touch, He prepares us for service, which brings us to our final point. If we've seen the Lord seated on His throne and the Lord in His holiness, if we've then seen and felt our own sinfulness and experienced the Lord's restoration, then finally, we need to give ourselves to the Lord's mission. We need to give ourselves to the Lord's mission, verses 8 to 13. If the first half of the chapter is Isaiah's vision, the second half is Isaiah's commission. But it's probably the biggest anticlimactic commissioning service you could ever attend even though God now speaks for the first time. Verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Isaiah responds willingly, Here I am, send me. And then look at the calling he has. Verse 9, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Some commentators try to soften these verses, uh, but I don't really think there's any way around them. Isaiah's ministry will be a ministry of hardening that leads to judgment. Even Isaiah is somewhat puzzled by it. And so he asks, verse 11, well, how long am I going to be the prophet of bad news? How long is that going to go on for, Lord? To which he replies, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the foreign and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. In other words, Isaiah's ministry is one of bringing about the inevitable judgment of God on people, on his people, which will result in a foreign invasion, first Assyria, then Babylon, where they are taken off to forsaken lands into exile. God wants Isaiah to be the preacher that hardens the heart that deafens the ear, that blinds the eye, so that judgment will fall. It was the same with Jesus' preaching. He taught in parables so that people would not repent, but continue to be blind and unrepentant. In fact, Jesus quotes Isaiah 6.10 and Mark 4, explaining why His preaching hardened the heart of those who heard it. But, and it's a very important but, Jesus hardened people's hearts, but in the end, it was a means to another end, the means towards the end of salvation. Jesus hardened the hearts of people and the religious leaders so that they would eventually crucify Him 
And what came out of the crucifixion? The salvation of the world. It was a a judgment salvation event, salvation through judgment. That's the two-beat rhythm of biblical history, judgment salvation, judgment salvation, judgment salvation. And that is why salvation, not judgment, is the final word of the gospel. And it was actually Isaiah's final word in his ministry. Did you note what it says at the very end of verse 13? And the holy seed is its stump. If you've ever cut a tree down in your garden, uh, you know that in order for it not to grow back, you've got to poison it within the first 30 minutes or so. If you don't, then that tree, what's going to happen to that stump? Uh, It'll just start growing a little shoot. The tree's going to grow back. And that is what God is saying here. He is going to fell Israel. He's going to fell Judah. But there will be a seed that will be the stump, and from that stump there will be a little shoot. There will be a few survivors through the exile, and then ultimately there will be one survivor, the remnant, the suffering servant king, who himself will be saved through judgment for the salvation of the world. In his judgment, God leaves only one holy seed. He leaves just one righteous man hanging on a cross. And from that one bloodied man on a cross, from that stump, a shoot will begin to spring. And that single shoot will transform the whole world. That is the last word of the gospel. Not judgment, but salvation. Which means that being part of God's mission is well worth our time and commitment. Because God is saving a people for himself through judgment for the salvation of the world. For each of us, that might look different. Some of us might go to the nations. Others will stay here and pray and give and serve in this church. But we are all involved in God's mission that through judgment, He is going to save a people for Himself. And if we've seen the Lord seated on His throne, if we've seen the Lord in His holiness, if we've felt our sinfulness, and experienced his restoration, then how else should we spend the rest of our lives but in the service of this king? Let us pray. Father, you have exalted your son to the highest place in this world, to your right hand. And as this nation enters a new era under a new president, Help us to remember that Jesus Christ, your Son, is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Remind us that he is seated, reigning, ruining, and soon to be returning. And while we wait for him to come and crush our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, help us to serve him with repentant but glad hearts. For your Son, our Savior, is King. And so it is in his name we now pray the words that he taught us to pray. The Tenth Commandment prohibits coveting anything that belongs to our neighbor. This is not merely a negative command, however, it also implies a positive one. It means that we're required by God to rejoice in what God has given to our neighbors. And refusal to do so is actually a form of hatred. When you see your neighbor's success, her house, his truck, her body, his wife, their family, their joy, their vacations, do you rejoice? Or is there a subtle or not so subtle pit in your stomach? And you might say, well, I don't mind them having those things, but why can't I? But this actually reveals why covetousness is such a hideous evil. It can sometimes be directed at the people who have what you want, but it's always directed at the God who is given. The hatred can be on the human level, and often is, but the hatred is always directed at the God who gives, at the God who has distributed his gifts as he pleases. So this is part of why God invites us here to this table week after week. You need to be reminded to give thanks. So first, thank God for what he's given to you. Not vaguely, not while rolling your eyes. Make a list. Start reviewing it regularly. 
What has God given to you? Life? Lungs that work without you telling them to? A heart that beats every second? Hands? Two legs? Do you have taste buds? What about your eyes? You're a walking testament to God's lavish generosity. And on top of all that, you've been forgiven all your sins and clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. That's what this meal means. It means that God has given himself for you and to you in Christ. And that leads to the second thing. All of God's gifts are fundamentally ways in which God is giving himself to us. But this means that God knows exactly how to give himself to us. Some of it is the same and some of it is different. Some have greater trials, some have greater triumphs, but it's the same Christ. It's the same Jesus. It's the same God, the same salvation given to all who believe. So look down your aisle as you partake this morning. Look behind you for a moment. Look in front of you. What has God given? He's given us himself. He's given us all that we need in Jesus. And God is good all the time. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. There's a great episode in the Gospel of Luke that echoes a lot of the themes that you've just heard in from Isaiah 6. In Luke 5, Jesus takes the, the, the disciples out fishing just before they've been called as fishermen. And, and of course, then they've, they've been fishing all night. There's no fish. You throw them in. They throw out the nets. They haul in this massive haul. And, and Simon, Peter, falls on his knees and says, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. It's, it's, it's this glorious echo. And of course, then Jesus is about to call him and says, it's okay. It's okay. I have work for you to do. It's a very similar story. But one of the glorious things about that story is in that moment, one of the things that Luke does, maybe he got it from Peter, is the first time Simon's called Simon, 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 all through there. And then right in that moment, when he falls on his knees, it says Simon Peter fell on his knees. There's other episodes, you know, where Simon gets the name Peter. But in Luke, there's a subtle point. When you're on your knees before the king, you are who you really are. Do you want to know who you are? Do you know, want to know what you're for? Then fall on your knees. He is the king, and he is for you all that you need. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of your God now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and grant you his peace. And amen.